Let's translate Acts 15, verses 28 and 29. Edoxen gar to pnevmakti to agio ke imin miden pleon epitetheste imin baros plin tuton ton epananches apecheste idolophiton ke emotos ematos ke pniknon pniknon ke pornias exon diatiruntes eavtus ev praxite eroste for it seems to the spirit to the holy spirit and to us no one or no greater mm, burden to you well here's the word burden so this is going to be place no greater burden placed on you than clean than these ton epanonkes these requirements to abstain idolothiton from idols this is specifically meat offered to idols and blood and choked and this says immorality but it's pornea so this is sexual immorality from which diatiruntes uh, from which keeping yourselves you do well you are doing well Farewell. If you want to show your support and sport some cool merch, pick up this Greek Jesus is Lord shirt from the merch store today. All right, so to do our diagram, gar, post positive. Here's our main verb with the built in subject. And here is our indirect object. Now, in this case, it's not actually the indirect object because dokeo here can take a dative direct object. Uh, but it's it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. What seems good? So here it's accusative. So that no one, no one put on you greater baros. Baros is neuter singular accusative. Pleon neuter singular accusative. Me then neuter singular accusative. Then we have the comparative plein. Is it comparative? Well, in this case, it appears to be genitive by context because of two-tone here. So this appears to be an improper preposition, meaning only or except. Not to put anything on you, any greater burden on you, except these ton epanonkes. These ton epanonkes these requirements, these necessities. And what are these necessities? To abstain from idols and from blood and from strangled and from corneas. So notice we have genitive plural here. Then we have genitive singular, genitive plural, genitive singular. So this is the list of things to abstain from. So I'm going to put X here because it's also genitive. And then our relative is also genitive. And then we have our phrase. Here we have a nominative participle with aftus being accusative. So dia uh, tireo to keep maintain from these, maintaining yourselves, literally, from these, maintaining yourselves, proxite, second person plural, future active indicative, then you are doing well, farewell. So it's a genitival construction with a relative clause with a nominative uh, I forget what that phrase is for the participle, but this is a, a nominative phrase. So we have three layers to this whole phrase here. It's nominative with a participle. It's genitive with a relative clause. It's genitive with the prepositional phrase. And then we have our main verb, second person plural, future active indicative. You will do well, proso. You will do well. 
So what's going on with this nominative? What seems to be the case here is X own is actually keeping yourselves from these or those you do well. So looking at the participle here, we need to figure out what is going on with dia tiruntes here because participles are very fluid and, and and they have a lot of different functions. So we need to figure out how is it actually functioning here? Starting with Wallace's Greek grammar here. This is taking us beyond the basics. We need to figure out, okay, is it adjectival or is it verbal? Well, it doesn't seem to be independent and it doesn't seem to be adjectival. Now we're into the verbal side. It doesn't appear to be dependent, although it could be, it might be a tenant circumstance. Normally you just translate it with an ing. Pe keeping yourselves from these, you do well, you will do well. It's not indirect discourse, it could be complementary. Is it paraphrastic? Is it redundant? Let's go through these. Is it imperative? That would be an independent use. Or is it functioning as an indicative? Um, actually, it could be it could be an absolute, a nominative absolute. So we've got a lot to consider here. Let's dive in. We know we, it's not an adjectival. So we're gonna move on to the verbal. Does it answer when, how, or why? Yes, it does. So uh, you do well, how? By keeping these things, keeping from these things. Or why? Why do you do well? By keeping these things, keeping yourselves from these things. So it, it does appear to be uh, adverbial. It's not temporal, it's not answering when. It could be manner, but that would be for participle of emotion or attitude. That's not the case here, but means, by means of, that could be a, a, a good usage here. Indicates the means by which the action of a finite verb is accomplished. This seems to be what we're dealing with. First, as we pointed out above, both the participle of manner and the participle of means answer the question how. Thus, there is some confusion between the two. Second, one should supply by or by means of before the participle in translation. I used by earlier. I think that works just fine. Third, there are some further guidelines that the student should employ to distinguish between means and manner. Participle of means answers the question how, but here, as opposed to the participle of manner, it seems a more necessary and implicit question. If the participle of means is absent or removed, the point of the main verb is removed as well. This is not normally true with manner. So if you remove keeping yourselves from these, the point of the main verb would be removed as well. Yeah, it is. In some sense, the participle of means almost always defines the action of the main verb. It, it makes more explicit what the author intended to convey with the main verb. I think this is what we're dealing with, but let's let's continue on to rule out the rest. Fourth, the participle of means could be called an apexegetical participle in that it defines or explains the action of the controlling verb. Again, I think this is this is it right here. Is it even listed in the example? No, it's not. It's not because it's not causal. Because keeping yourselves from these. No, it's not that doesn't make sense conditional if well maybe that's it the the participle implies a condition on which the fulfillment of the idea indicated by the main verb depends ooh this could be the case its force can be introduced by if in translation if you keep yourselves from these things then you do well ah this one really really fits doesn't it the participle is almost always equivalent to the third class condition, usually representing some sense of uncertainty. Yeah, it's uncertain if you'll keep yourselves from these. And it overlaps with the participle of means at times. Interesting. Note it's not listed here. Ah, it is right there. 
It's either means or condition, as Wallace puts right here. 1529. Concession, although, no, that doesn't make sense. Purpose. So this would be in order to, that doesn't make sense. Result, this would be the end of the action of the main verb. Mm, no, that doesn't seem to be the point here. Attendant circumstance. So this is used to communicate an action that in some sense is coordinate with the finite verb. In this respect, it is not dependent for it is translated like a verb, yet it's still de dependent semantically because it cannot exist without the main verb. So it's piggybacked. So normally, attendant circumstance is not ing translated, uh, but it, it piggybacks on the main verb and takes the same kind of uh, translation. So you can see in the example here, parevthentes, although it's a participle, it's translated similarly to estin here, um, and mathete. So go and learn. And this is a command, mathete. So that doesn't seem to be the case here. It's not keep and do. Uh, so it doesn't appear to be a tenant circumstance. It's not indirect discourse, we know that. Complementary. So this completes the thought of the uh, of the main verb. It's especially used in combination with the verb suggesting a consummative. So this is stop, pavo, or progressive, continue, epimeno, idea. And this idiom is rare in the New Testament. You see Acts 5, Acts 12, Peter kept on knocking. They did not cease teaching. So this, this does not appear to be the case. It's not complimentary. Paraphrastic. And an arthrist participle, which is what we have here, can be used with a verb of being. That is not what we have. Paraphrastic is a roundabout way of saying what could be expressed by a single verb. So this is not the case. Redundant, planastic. So this is a verb of saying or sometimes thinking uh, which can be used with the participle with basically the same meaning. That is not what we have here. So, apokrinome is to answer. Ipen is to say. Those are essentially the same thing. Independent verbal participles. We have an imperative. That's not the case here. And used as an indicative. This can be an independent proper or absolute. The participle can stand alone in a declarative sense as the only verb in a clause or sentence. This is not the only verb. We also have uh, proso. So this is not the case. The participle absolute. In this final section on participles, we will be dealing with participles that occur in particular case constructions. These are known as the nominative absolute or the genitive absolute. These participles do, however, fit under the above two broad categories, adjectival and verbal. They are treated here separately because they involve structural clues related to their cases and to some degree they express an additional nuance beyond what has been described in the above two major categories. So it's okay to say it's a nominative absolute while at the same time saying it's a participle of means or a conditional participle. Now it's nominative, right? We have nominative plural here. So it's a nominative absolute, meaning in the phrase, there's no other controlling verb. The nominative absolute participle is in reality simply a substantival participle that fits the case description of nominativus pendens. Although it is called nominative absolute, it is not to be confused with the case category of nominative absolute. This label, which has been the cause of much confusion, probably is derived from the fact that this participle has some affinity with the genitive absolute participle. So the nominativist pendants, this is pendant nominative, consists in the enunciation of the logical, but not the grammatical subject at the beginning of the sentence. And it, it is followed by a sentence in which that subject is taken up by a pronoun in the case required by the syntax. 
So this does appear to be a nominative absolute, as well as the fact that it's means and or conditional. It is substantival. Usually when it's substantival, it has the definite article. In our case, it does not, but it can still be substantival even without the definite article. It's rare, but it can occur. So I'm not gonna worry about the nominative absolute here, although it does appear to me to be one. Whether it's by or if makes little difference to me. The point is on abstaining from these things, to abstain from meat offered to idols, from blood, from strangled, from sexual immorality. By keeping from these things, by keeping yourselves from these things, you, you will do well. Let me ask you, did you find this diagram helpful? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you didn't, let me know what you did find helpful. Is it okay to translate os in this way? So as a relative pronoun, it means who, which, what, or that. But here you see it can be a demonstrative pronoun. This one. And this would be the singular. So if it's plural, it's these. So let's dive into the rest of the vocabulary. Dokeo is to consider as probable, think, believe, suppose, consider. This is the transitive of subjective opinion. And it has an infinitive following when its subject is identical with that of the infinitive or followed by the infinitive with a nominative. That's not the case here. Followed by accusative and infinitive with subject. Uh, not identical with OT following. It can be to appear to one's understanding, seen, be recognized as. And this appears to be the overarching gloss and understanding of this verb. At an impersonal level, it seems to me, it seems best to me. So I decide, I resolve with infinitive following. And here we have Acts 15:28. So it seems best to whom? To the Holy Spirit. Agios is an adjective, originally a cultic concept of the uh, quality possessed by things and persons that could approach a divinity as an adjective pertaining to being dedicated or consecrated to the service of God. used of angels, of Christ, of God, of spirit. So this shades over into the sense of holy, meaning pure, perfect, or worthy of God. Pnevma mean air, breath, and to that end, spirit, right? part of human personality, an independent non-corporeal being in contrast to a being that can be perceived by the physical senses. God's being as controlling influence with focus on association with humans. So spirit, and you can see the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Boom, there we go. And to us, meden. So medis, you can see meden is the neuter. Uh, it's an as an adjective. It's pertaining to there not being any. So simply translated, no. As a substantive, it's a negative reference to an entity, event, or condition. So you might translate that as nobody or nothing. Here it seems simply to be negating. Pleon, no, greater. Leon is from police. The comparative is Leon, um, or here you can see Leon as li listed in Acts 15:28. Miren Leon, Leon. So it means per 
pertaining to being a large number, many, a great number of, or pertaining to being relatively large in quantity or measure. And here we have as a substantive pleon or pleon, more, the greater sum, the greater part, receive a larger sum. With partitive genitive, they will arrive at an even greater measure of impiety, become more and more deeply involved in impiety. With the genitive of comparison, now we're cooking, something greater, more important than food. The widow put in more than all the rest, more than. Meden pleon, now we're cooking. This is exactly what we've got, nothing more. So the words than except following are expressed by para or by plean. There we go. That's what we have. So nothing more than. So it's a comparison, nothing more than. But baros, baros. This is experience of something that is particularly oppressive, a burden, a weight, a burden. This is oppressive. This is used of work that's exhausting. It's used of temptations, used of law, not, not necessarily the law of Moses, but just any law to impose a burden on someone. Balin, baros, epitina. So you can see Acts 15, 28 for this, epitene, uh, teeny baros, right? So burden, oppression, okay? No greater burden, no greater burden, what? Epitithemi, to be placed, laid upon you. Lay, put upon. This is to place something on or transfer to a place or an object. It is figurative in the active, except 1528 below. Here it's passive. It doesn't add any additional context, you see? It goes, here's an example where it's passive. It makes no additional comment. Then it moves on to a different context. You can tell because of the M dash, but it's figurative lay upon. So it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us that no greater burden be laid upon you than these tone epanankes. So this word means pertaining to being essential in connection with something of a necessary nature. So the necessary things is tantamount to saying the things necessarily to be imposed. Now you'll notice that the entry here in BDAG says C Ananki. This is necessity, pressure, distress, calamity, pressure, compulsion by forcible means, torture, essential in connection with something of a necessary nature. We'll translate it along the lines of essentials, or you could say necessities. Apeko, to receive in full what is due to be paid in full, receive in full, to meet the need of the moment, to suffice, to be enough. Frequent expression, uden, apeki, nothing hinders. To be at some distance from a position, be distant. Interesting. Distance yourself from. To avoid contact with or use of something, keep away from, abstain from, refrain from. And here's Acts 15, 29. So you refrain from the idolothiton, 
uh, Emotos, Ematos, Pnictone, Corneas. Abstain from things offered to idols, blood, things strangled, and irregular sexual union. And it says, see Leviticus 18, 6 through 30. And compare with verse 20. So it's to avoid contact with or use of something, keep away from, abstain from, refrain from. Idolothetone, this is idolothetos. This is something offered to a cultic image or idol. Typically it's food sacrificed to idols. It's an expression. It was possibly only within the Israelite tradition. It was used in a derogatory sense. Polytheists said, Erothetone. Uh, it refers to sacrificial meat, part of which was burned on the altar as the deity's portion. So, to idolothetone, theate demonios, demonia, demonies. Part was eaten at a solemn meal in the temple and part was sold in the market for home use. Now, within the Mosaic tradition, it was unclean and therefore forbidden. So it's meat that was offered to idols. Do not eat that. And em ematos. This is blood. So literally, blood as basic component of an organism. And this is the blood of animals. It is its use as food is forbidden in the Jerusalem decree. And pnictone in Acts it plainly means strangled, choked to death. This is used of animals killed without having the blood drained from them, whose flesh the Israelites were forbidden to eat. Now in Pythagorean dietary laws, uh, you could not eat meat from animals that have not been properly slaughtered. Meaning you've got the meat with the blood still in it. And then there's pornea. BDAG says this is used of various kinds of unsanctioned sexual intercourse. It's used of unlawful sexual intercourse, so prostitution, unchastity, fornication. And here you see it down here. It could be participation in prohibited degrees of marriage, fornication. It's also used of immorality of a transcendent nature, also translated as fornication. Uh, but this is tied to polytheistic cult and cultic practices. And uh, that is perhaps in large part because some Semitic and Greco-Roman cults were at times connected with sexual debauchery. So you will refrain from idol meat or meat offered to idols, from blood, from strangled meat, and from fornication, immorality, sexual immorality. From these, so X, it's ek. Before vowels, it's X, which is what we have here. It can mean a marker denoting separation from, of persons and things with whom a connection is severed or is to remain severed. From these, dia tireo. So this is to keep something mentally with implication of duration or to keep oneself from doing something. Keep free of. Keep oneself free from these. AF2, this is AF2. It is uh, reflexive. Variously replacing contract 
uh, forms of of two, of tone. It can be used for the first and second, and that's what we have here. So keeping yourselves, by keeping yourselves, or if you keep yourselves from these things, you will do well. So proso, to bring about or accomplish something through activity. Do, accomplish. To engage in activity or behave in a certain way, intransitive, so act or behave. Or to experience what is going on, be, be situated. So you will be well off, or since it's an engaging in activity or behaving in a certain way, act, behave, then you are behaving well, then you act well, or simply you do well. Ev here is an adverb pertaining to that which is good or beneficial as applied to interpersonal relationships or experience. So, peen ev, do good, show kindness. So, do well, act correctly, or act rightly. Ev prosin thus expresses a fundamental feature in the reciprocity system that ran through Greco-Roman society. Recipients of a benefit act correctly by reciprocating in some way. And then the letter finishes off, eroste. This is Ronimi. It was obsolete in New Testament times in the active. Here, it is middle passive. In this use, it's be in good health, farewell, goodbye. So the force is be in good health, but you translate it farewell or goodbye. So to translate it, for it seemed best to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no greater burden than these necessary things, these essentials, to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from strangled meat, and from fornication. By keeping yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. If you liked this video, hit the like button. But if you wanna keep watching, go ahead and watch this video here to learn more about how to translate Acts 13, 38, and 39. We'll see you next time.